Hello and welcome to um, the series Focus on Family. My name is Kate Mahoney and I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the executive director of the Naomi Ruth Cohen Institute for Mental Health Education at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. I'm so delighted tonight to be able to introduce you to Jeremy Fine. Uh, Jeremy is uh, recently graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Washington University in St. Louis where he majored in philosophy, neuroscience, and psychology and minored in music. So you can tell he was a busy person there. Um, when Jeremy was a sophomore, he was diagnosed with um, OCD, Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. And since then, he's given many presentations about the experiences of living with OCD, really to promote um, mental health destigmatization, to kind of help people understand this disorder and to work on kind of battling against people having stigma or making um, light of it or making jokes about it, etc. So Jeremy has, is quite distinguished. He's had his research published in the uh, Journal of American Medicine Psychiatry. Um, he's a speaker for NAMI, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Um, they're ending the silence program. And he's currently taking a gap year from college as he's applying to MD, PhD <laughs> programs um, in psychiatry you. and neuroscience. So I'm really happy to welcome you, Jeremy. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks so much. And um, we're glad that you could squeeze us in because clearly you've got a pretty busy schedule. You're out there doing a lot, trying to help educate. You're working as a mental health practitioner, um, really trying to take a look at a variety of things. Yeah. But I'm wondering tonight if you could just kind of help tell us a little bit about obsessive compulsive disorder. What are some of the criteria for identifying it? Sure. So, um, first off, thank you so much for having me. Um, so, OCD. Um, it used to actually be classified as an anxiety disorder, but now it's kind of its own category of illness. Um, and the name says a lot, so it's called Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. So it is an illness characterized by obsessions and compulsions. Um, and so, you know, the classic kind of media portrayal of OCD is it's somebody who washes their hands a lot, um, it's somebody who is um, really neat and organized, kind of like Monk from the TV show Monk that was on for a while. Um, and that's not necessarily an incorrect portrayal of OCD, but it's just very incomplete. So what obsessions really are is they are intrusive thoughts that last over a long period of time. So what's an intrusive thought? Intrusive thoughts are thoughts everybody has, um, regardless if you have OCD or not. Um, and they are thoughts that are disturbing to us or thoughts that we disapprove of. For example, um, many of us, I'm sure, have had the experience that we're driving on the road and we see a car next to us and we're just like, eh, I, could, I could run this person off the road right now. Um, hopefully nobody does that. Um, but that's an example of an intrusive thought. That thought might kind of scare us, say like, oh, do I want to do that? Um, and most of the time, um, individuals are simply able to discard that thought, um, just kind of throw it away. But in OCD, the nature of the illness is that that thought gets stuck there. I kind of like to call OCD sticky brain disease because these intrusive thoughts just kind of, they, they really grasp onto people. Yeah. Um, and so you could see why um, if somebody had, let's take that thought, for example, of wanting to run somebody off the road. That's an example of a, like a harm thought, possibly. So let's say an OCD sufferer had that thought, like, um, I want to run this person off the road right now. Their response would be, because that thought wouldn't go away, that would make them incredibly anxious. Um, and they would worry that, oh my gosh, this is something I want to do. I must be a horrible person if I want to run people off the road. Um, and so in order to combat the anxiety associated with these stuck intrusive thoughts or obsessions, um, OCD sufferers perform compulsions. Now compulsions can be overt, which means physical actions that people can see, or covert, um, which are mental actions. Um, I tended, um, when I was really suffering and using a lot of compulsions, I was using um, covert compulsion, so nobody could really see I was struggling. Right. Um, and so, an example of an overt compulsion, using the same example of wanting to run someone off the road, um, would be uh, a really common one is uh, people drive around the same route over and over and over. 
because let's say the intrusive thought is, oh my gosh, I hurt somebody while I was driving, or I ran somebody over. Um, in order to verify that you didn't and diminish the anxiety associated with that, the OCD sufferer will go over and over and over. And so they would kind of check and recheck. Absolutely, and yeah. Okay. And, um, you know, and let's say someone without OCD did that, they might go around and check once, like, oh, did I hurt somebody? Um, and they'd realize they didn't, and they'd just kind of move on with their day. But with OCD, the thought sticks with the sufferer, so they will do it over and over and over and over. And initially that helps with the anxiety, but over time that actually tends to make it worse. It's, yeah, it's just kind of like a quick fix. Um, and so some of the common um, obsessional uh, categories are harm. Um, postpartum OCD is a very common um, instance where harm themes occur. So new mothers will have their child and they will get an intrusive thought saying like, I want to like, like harm my baby. I want to hold him under the bathwater. Or he won't stop crying. I want to strangle him, which I'm sure many new mothers have thought um, that very few have ever acted on it. An OCD sufferer would never ever act on these thoughts. They would they would internalize them and they would make them incredibly anxious. Um, so it's really sad. Which sadly, then would probably also interfere with being able to parent because while you're riddled with the anxiety about that, it's hard to get rest, it's hard to sit there and soothe your, your infant yeah. because you are so over, overcome with your own fears. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was reading this one story of a woman the other day, and OCD tends to just bring on the scariest thoughts possible. It brings on thoughts that are directly against people's morals and values, and that's why it makes people so anxious. Um, so this one woman who recently gave birth to a child started having like horrible intrusive thoughts about sexually abusing the child, which she would never do in a million years because she would never hurt a child. Her ethics, yes. Yeah. Um, and when she actually told her employer about these thoughts and how much they were just ruining her life, she worked with kids and she was fired from her job. Um, she would never hurt a child. The nature of the illness is that the sufferers are just so incredibly anxious that, they, that they're that they having these thoughts that they think they actually want to act on them, when in reality they never would, and in fact are probably a lot less likely to than anybody else because they're so anxious about them. But what's hard then is it can really, I mean there's a classic example of how having an unidentified and an untreated mental health problem, specifically in this case OCD, interfered with somebody's livelihood, or their ability to have a job. Um, and it sounds like more often people who are struggling with obsessive compulsive disorder are less likely to really share their thoughts or feelings. And sadly, when this woman actually did, it reinforced why why it's dangerous to do so, which exactly. is not good. We want to create a more open, supportive environment where people can talk about these struggles. Absolutely. Um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about, for you, when it was that you started thinking that perhaps you had um, an actual uh, kind of definable, diagnosable obsessive compulsive disorder. Sure. So um, my symptoms started manifesting as thoughts about relationships. Um, I was... Um, I had a partner and I like just walk around my day and think, oh, this other person's attractive. And then the thought would be, oh my gosh, does that mean I'm like trying to cheat on my girlfriend? Does that mean I'm like a bad person? And like, is, is, is that my moral? And I remember one day I like these thoughts would just get so stuck and I would feel so guilty about them that one morning I woke up four hours early to do work and got 20 minutes of work done because I was just trying to like go back through my life and pick instances that showed myself that you know I'm not this horrible person I don't want to do this but as I said before that doesn't help um, and so, so you're kind of fighting with yourself yeah right? I was I was really fighting with with these thoughts that physically couldn't go away they were ingrained in my brain um, and you know I started seeing a therapist the therapist really wasn't helping very much. Um, you know, 
as any normal person would, when I thought I wanted to do all these horrible things, I became very depressed because I thought I was just this horrible person, sure. super common in OCD. Um, that's why there's a very high comorbidity with major depressive disorder. So you were really judging yourself. I was really judging myself until um, one day I just started Googling my symptoms and I felt kind of comfortable doing that because it was in my area of study. I'm definitely not advising anybody to use the internet to diagnose themselves. Um, but I found people online who were having really similar experiences to me, um, kind of these thoughts along the same lines with relationships. And they were like, oh, yeah, I have OCD. And I read that and I was like, I don't have OCD. I don't wash my hands. Like, I, like, I, I had no idea. I went from not knowing anything or ever having OCD and thinking it was just the monk disease right, yes. um, to like learning a completely different understanding of the illness. And well, it's certainly true that a lot of times people have thoughts about contamination because your health is something that you're naturally concerned about. Sure. Um, and like, you know, if you are worried you are sick, it, it's kind of, it, it makes sense that that's a theme that can get stuck with somebody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I kind of ended up figuring out that, okay, I, I think I have OCD. Um, I knew the next step was to get on medication um, and talk to a psychiatrist. Uh, unfortunately, in St. Louis at the time, there was a six-month wait to see a psychiatrist, like four wow. to six months. Yeah. Um, but then I had the idea of um, calling my great uncle, who was actually a psychiatrist in California. So thankfully I had that resource because otherwise I don't know what I would have done because I couldn't have, I, I was in a really bad place at that point. Mm -hmm. I'd been depressed and, you know, my OCD was just rampant for months on end and I wasn't able to do the things I enjoyed in life anymore. Um, and that's what's really, I think, um, helpful for people to understand is how, A, exhausting it can be, right? Because oh, you're yeah. battling with yourself and you've got these thoughts and feelings and you're trying to manage that. And how misunderstood this particular disorder and many mental health issues are. And sadly, there might, you know, there are often very, very effective treatments, medication, yeah. uh, counseling, a variety of things. But sometimes we just don't get to the right place right? Um, because either there's, maybe there's a waiting list, maybe it's more though that we just don't know or understand. Exactly. And, um, and the self-judgment is sounds so painful, right? That, you know, that feeling like, are you a bad person because you're having these thoughts or feelings? Yeah. Um, so again, the fact that you're willing to share your story and people can say, you know, here you are, you know, you graduated successfully from college with a lot of <laughs> honor, you're ready to embark on a medical career, and yet this mental health issue really kind of had a grip on you for a chunk of time and was really, really affecting your day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I mean, I was at the point where I couldn't have a conversation with a friend because my thoughts were just so overwhelming and powerful. And, you know, uh, OCD really is a thought-based illness. And it's, it's certainly not an action-based illness. The issue is that the sufferer often um, distorts the, the idea that their thoughts and their actions are the same thing when they're really not. The, like, it, and kind of like what you were saying, it, it's so misunderstood mm -hmm. that the suicide rate for OCD is 10 times the national average. Wow. Um, That's a really important statistic for people to understand. Mm -hmm. And people often go... I think the average was seven years without a diagnosis of suffering. Wow. And I could not have gone that long. I would have been in the other statistic if I had gone that long because I just wasn't, wasn't able to live my life, um, which is why I think it's so important to speak out about it because, you know, people with OCD have a mental illness. They're not bad people. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, a lot of the time they're people with really strong morals and values. And... They just happen to have this illness that is forcing them to examine their own morals and values in a way that nobody else ever really has to. Right, with so much scrutiny. Yes. Yeah, and so it's, like you said, it, it gets to be an exhausting process, and especially people with physical compulsions. You know, I have friends with OCD who have scars on their hands just from washing their hands so many yes. times. Yes. Um, kind of one of the physical signs of a mental illness. So, yeah, that's why it, it's really vital to educate about all mental illnesses, OCD in particular too, because like if, if someone had told me um, like 
when I was 18, like the year before I started having OCD thoughts, like, hey, like, I'm having thoughts about, like, harming my family member, I would have been like, that's, <laughs> why, are you, why are you having those thoughts? Do you really want to harm your family member? Like, what's, that's kind of concerning. Um, but now, having had it myself and dealt with it, I know that nobody with OCD is actually dangerous. Um, and in fact, the vast majority of the time, OCD sufferers recognize how irrational their thoughts are. They'll realize, like, I've, I've loved my brother my whole life. Why would I all of a sudden want to hurt him? Right. And, you know, over time, people kind of recognize that, okay, this person really hasn't done this thing, but they're still very anxious that they want to do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, which is why uh, publicly educating about OCD, I think, is so important, because if sufferers felt more comfortable um, speaking up about the thoughts they had, then maybe it wouldn't be a seven-year wait until people sought treatment. Absolutely. And that was one of the reasons I was just so excited that you were willing to come on tonight because thinking there may be both some people here who are seeing the show who are themselves might be struggling or we might have friends, family members, co-workers. And I think you're uh, right. I'm so glad you brought up the television show Monk, which I, mm -hmm. you know, he was a very lovable character, but yeah. he had very external kind of behaviors yes. that we sometimes smiled at, sometimes laughed at. Mm -hmm. um, and I think many of us have joked, you know, I've had the experience myself of going back in my house, of already being in my car and asking, did I turn the coffee maker off? Yeah. And I'm very relieved now to have one of those coffee makers that after two hours <laughs> I know is going to shut itself off, but I've gone back and checked that, or did I lock yeah. the door when I left the house? Absolutely. Um, so many of us have had small variations of that, of those worries, but that's very different than having this disorder with a really ser uh, set of criteria. But what we want to do is have people be able to talk more openly and know that there are um, effective strategies for living with um, OCD. And we need to stop doing the kind of the joking or the laughing and recognizing um, that it can be pretty debilitating in terms of, again, the energy and the distraction right. from your goals. Absolutely. And, you know, I'd like... Something I said before I was diagnosed was, oh, I'm so OCD about this. Um, having no idea that I was going to have OCD mm -hmm. um, in the future. And I, I, re I genuinely don't think anybody is effortfully trying to demean anybody or minimize the experience of somebody else. I just think there's really a lack of understanding out there about this illness, which affects between 1% to 3% of the population. Um, so... I want to mention to our callers, again, that you know we have Jeremy here as an expert both in terms of some of the work and research he's done on this and an and, and advocate and share, being willing to share his own experience. So if you are interested in giving us a call, you're welcome to call in at 312-738-1060. Um, and also, um, sometimes when we do these shows and sometimes you're not sure you want to have your voice on the air, um, that there's also the possibility of just reaching out to us via our website, the Naomi Ruth Cohen Institute. And um, you can direct emails to me. My email address is there, kmahoney at thechicagoschool.edu, and our telephone number at the Institute. And we could find a way to connect you with Jeremy and his expertise if you prefer to have a conversation um, not on the air. But we do want to make sure people know that they're able to um, reach out to us now. I'm just curious, Jeremy, about... For your family and your mm -hmm. friends, when you were finally diagnosed or when you were in the process of, of getting an, um, kind of an appropriate diagnosis, sure. how did people react? Great question. And one of the things that helped me get through the worst parts of my experience was my incredible support network. Um, my friends and family um, were so understanding. Um, but that being said, it's a really difficult illness to conceptualize. It's not something that's intuitive to people. Mm -hmm. You know, having an understanding of how thoughts work isn't really something we are taught. Right. Um, and so uh, after the hardest parts were over and after my medication helped stabilize me and I had been through some therapy, um, I called up all my closest friends, sat down, had lunch with them, and said, hey, this is what I've been dealing with for the past few months. This might explain a couple of things. Sure. Um, sure. And they were so understanding. And as to my parents, I actually sat them down 
um, and watched a documentary on OCD with them. Um, there's this incredible documentary on YouTube called Living With Me and My OCD, um, where it just goes through different vignettes of sufferers' experiences, and it really does a great job in portraying the diversity of experiences that people can have mm -hmm. within OCD. Because again, all everybody with OCD gets stuck thoughts, but the way that those thoughts manifest themselves are different. Um, and not everybody is neat and organized, right? So yeah. again, you know, it doesn't mean that everybody is oh, focused my, on my their room personal is so messy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Um, so yeah, uh, my parents and family were incredible about it, and luckily, just <laughs> just to make sure we get this in, I'm I'm doing very well now. I really don't. Um, my OCD affects me very little, if at all, nowadays. Um, my medication's incredibly helpful, and with a regiment of exercise, mindfulness meditation, incredible support network, um, and just self-care in general. One of my favorite things in the world is, um, as you mentioned, uh, is playing music. Um, and I make a lot of my own music. A lot of it has to do with mental health, and I just love making music and putting it out in the world for people to listen to. So that's like one of my coping strategies is just expressing myself via music um, and, and putting it out there for people. And what's so. nice, those strategies you just talked about, those sort of self-help strategies, can be useful for a variety of mental health issues or just in general promoting mental wellness maybe long before anyone ever has um, a diagnosable mental yes. health um, condition. But, you know, a lot of us focus on our physical health. We think about what we're eating, whether we're exercising enough, um, are we getting enough sleep or not, is something that some of us still struggle with, but there's the least conversation about that. Yeah. We still don't have enough conversation infused in our day-to-day -day lives about how are we taking care of our mental health and right. promoting mental wellness. So it's great that you're willing to share yeah. that what's working for you. Yeah, and it... You know, the body of evidence-based research out there on how exercise and meditation can improve mental health is, is, is vast. It's like we know for a fact that exercise and mindfulness practices can dramatically change people's lives. Um, I meditate all the time. It's super helpful. It's not a religious thing at all. It's completely secular, but it really just teaches you how to focus on what's in front of you and live outside your head instead of inside your head. Um, yeah, and another brief coping thing that really helps too is humor. Um, as we said, it, you know, it's really important to not minimize people's experiences, but now that my family and my friends kind of understand OCD, I make jokes about it all the time because that helps um, normalize the experience for me, not to minimize what my experience is, and it's important that we don't make jokes about it if we don't have an understanding of it, right. but just being able to have like these casual interactions and talking about my OCD has been incredibly helpful and is a testament to how wonderful my support network is. And humor in general, again, not even if it were related to the condition, but being able to laugh to make sure we're bringing yeah. laughter into our life, um, that we are sharing joy and laughter with others. It's a way of connecting and communicating, and it can be, uh, there are such a thing as laughter therapy, right? Yeah. <laughs> laughter laughter yoga I believe yeah. so really thinking through again how we can use humor is really wonderful um, are there any other myths or stereotypes we just really have a, about you know 90 seconds left but really wanting to say there's anything else other than again some people do struggle with hand washing or are yeah. very neat or maybe feel um, phobia about germs etc but are there other things that we should be kind of try, either trying to debunk or help people realize that so much of it can be happening inside it's the thoughts that are, are not visible or apparent to anyone else. Yeah, um, and I guess the last thing I would want to emphasize is that OCD can really be about anything. Um, one of the vignettes in that documentary I mentioned earlier, um, a man was obsessed with um, the idea that he was going blind, and he had had 20-20 vision his whole life, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and he was constantly checking to make sure he could see things, and like I said earlier, OCD sufferers understand how irrational this is. I mean, this guy was 
constantly checking to make sure he could see things, and he was telling all his friends, like, this, this is ridiculous. I know I can see, but, uh, but I have this thought that won't go away. And I just think that the biggest takeaway is that OCD is really a cognitive thought-based illness, um, and it doesn't have to be about anything in particular. It can really be about any thought that gets stuck. And the last thing is that there are effective treatments. And they're very effective And we treatments. want people to realize that. So it's something we want to talk about. We want to get help for ourselves and for the, our people in our lives that we love. And with that, I just want to thank you, Jeremy, for Absolutely. being here today. Have a good evening.